I'd like to uh, ask Father Carl to come up and cast the vision. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Kay. I'm Father Carl, just in case you didn't know. And, uh, I've actually been sharing, I've been thinking quite a bit about my involvement in the congregation through the years and uh, with my dad's passing. I'm, I'm actually fourth generation in this church. My great-grandparents uh, came here. My dad remembers the red brick church. He remembers the earthquake and, and that coming down. Uh, and my kids are, are now the uh, fifth generation in the church, which is just I think it's marvelous. It's hard to find that in California. So, one of the things that we did talk about in those wilderness years is that the church is not the building, but the people. And I think we really found that those weren't words alone when we were in those wilderness years. It really was the community of the church family that held us together. And with that, our mission stayed the same, even in those wilderness years where we lived in a, in a tent, as it were, and kept having to pick up and move. Our mission was to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ through worship, learning, fellowship, and outreach. And that's a loose reworking of Acts 2.42, which is a description of the church right after Pentecost, where Scripture says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and breaking of bread and the prayers and that God added daily to their number those who were being saved. Worship, learning, fellowship, outreach. And that's what the church is about. And maybe put that a little more succinctly, our mission is to grow as disciples who make disciples. That's what everything is about. And we really do see our buildings then as a tool for making disciples. One of the things I do remember is when we left our old facility downtown on 17th Street, we walked out the front door carrying the reserve sacrament. And one of the things that really struck me in that moment is I longed for the day when we were going to have a home to put the reserve sacrament back into. And so when we held our first service here in 2017 on Monday, Thursday, I knew God was the only one who could have orchestrated that. We wanted to be in long before then. We managed to pull that one off, long story for another time. But if you know anything about the Monday Thursday service, at the very end of the service, you strip the altar and take the reserve sacrament out. And I remember noting in the sermon, it's as though God is telling us to keep our focus. As much as we want buildings, the buildings are not the goal. The one thing we needed, we've always had, and that is Jesus. And we still see it that way. We really do believe that our buildings are a gift from God to be used to grow as disciples who make disciples. And we believe that God has put us here in this place for a reason. That this is no accident that we are here at the corner of Buena Vista and Campus Park. And so you see our mission field. Here we are in this neighborhood that God has placed us in. One of the things we've talked about in leadership is that we really would love to be not just a church in this neighborhood, but a church that is a part of the life of this neighborhood. So it's kind of a cool picture looking off to the east there on one of those rare days when it actually rained. Things look clean and beautiful. So that's looking to our east, out through the back wall there, thousands of homes that way. And here in the Belcourt neighborhood, we already have over 500 homes built, 200 more by the end of the year, and within the next 20 years, moving to the west and then north on Allen, another two to 3,000 homes in the Belcourt community already planned to be built. This is our mission field. This is where we are called to grow as disciples who reach out to our neighbors and make disciples. And our buildings then are part of how we do that. Our buildings are very busy. I'm not going to read all of these to you, but as you look at them, you'll see that we are very busy in growing through learning and fellowship and outreach and worship. And up there on the screen are many of the ways that we learn primarily in learning and fellowship. And so we have a vibrant preschool that reaches out to the community and shares the love of Christ with their little ones. We have a nursery program, Sunday school, youth group, all helping our young ones grow in the knowledge and love of the Lord. We have small groups for all ages, Bible studies, men's ministry, women's ministry. We reach into people's lives in those particular niches where they need to know how to follow Jesus. Times like grief with grief share. Times like 
being in business with Business Goals Ministry, and for those struggling with their finances, Financial Peace University. We have healing ministry that takes place for the Order of St. Luke and the Daughters of the Holy Cross Prayer Ministry. So we are growing as disciples in all these ways, and our campus is very busy. And we're busy as well with outreach. I think this is one of our best kept secrets, but we have always been busy reaching out into the world around us to make disciples. We support missionaries in foreign nations and here in our own neck of the woods through Deacon John and Chris Miller, we're active in prison ministry. And through Deacon John as well, we're active in life recovery ministry. as partnering ministries at Jason's retreat in Capistrano House, reaching men and women who are coming out of prison and trying to transition back into everyday life. And for those who've been around for a while, you know that's what Jason's Christmas tree is about every Christmas, where we gather together gifts for the children of those in that life recovery program so that during the holiday season, they don't have the added stress of wondering whether they'll be able to give gifts to their kids. Through Deacon Ron and his work with flood ministry to the homeless, we continue to partner with them at the Green Garden Apartments. As soon as COVID is wrapped up enough for them to open that back up, we'll be back in there putting on events for them. We gather street kits a couple times a year to send those out with their trained teams who work face-to-face -face with those who are homeless. And we've also done outreach through different kinds of events. Before COVID hit us back in 2019, we had a craft fair with over 50 vendors and over 200 people in attendance, people not from this church at all. Back with Love Your Neighborhood, we were one of the inaugural campuses for that service arm of the Kern Leadership Alliance and City Serve Ministry, reaching out to those who are at the margins of life with basic things that they need, things like food and haircuts, and giving them groceries and prayer and help, and even giving them family photos. I, I just always love throwing that one in there, that they've got actual statistics that show that families that have a photo on the wall tend to have fewer problems because it shows that something is invested in their family. And so we gave them a professional family portrait by the time they left. We also host events that allow other people to come in and experience our church family, things like parish barbecues and fall festivals and healing ministry events like we did with Mike Evans. So we're a very active campus, active and growing as disciples who make disciples. But we also believe that there is so much more that we could do. And so what I'd like you to do is just dream with me for a moment of what could happen if we had a sanctuary for worship and were also able, therefore, to use this room, the fellowship hall, for its long-term intended purpose. So if we were able to use the fellowship hall for its long-term purpose, it would mean a, a lot of things could happen that are just a lot more challenging to make happen now. Right now, if we want to use this room for anything other than worship, we have to do what we call flip the room. We've got to pick up the chairs. We've got to pick up the kneelers. I don't know if any of you have been involved in doing that, although looking at you, I know some of you have. I don't mind the chairs. The kneelers really bother my back. It's not fun to flip the room, but it takes time and energy and a lot of logistics. It's not the kind of thing that you can just pull off in a day's time. We really would be able to eliminate the time, energy, and logistics that are involved in using this room for any other purpose than worship right now. And be, if we were able to do that, there are a lot of other things we could offer. So we've talked a lot in leadership about some of the things that we'd like to be able to do. One of the things that we recognize is that we have a mission field here every Monday through Friday in the preschool. The majority of the people in the preschool, vast majority, are not members of this church, and yet we have the privilege of ministering to their children. And so they trust us. And it is a wonderful opportunity to reach out to them. And so we've floated ideas like being able to magnify some of the things that they already do. They have gatherings for parents several times a year based on events on the calendar, things like donuts with dad for Father's Day and muffins with mom for Mother's Day and grandparents' day events. But right now they have to cram them into a small room and hallway in order to make them fit. How much more could we do in reaching them if they were able to be in here? We've talked about having a time for them to come in here and have some coffee and maybe a Bible study for moms after drop-off in the morning. We've noticed that many of the families like to stop and talk to each other at drop-off and at pick-up, a wonderful opportunity to reach into that mission field that comes to us five days a week. We've talked about being able to do weekday and weeknight Bible study programs here at the church. 
just the other night talking about what would it look like if we're able to do a, a Wednesday night dinner or something like that where people come together and eat a meal and then the kids go to a program, something maybe like a WANA and the adults stay for an adult program and then after that everyone goes home. Things that would, I think, really reach out to all the families that are right here around this church as we speak. It would also allow us to serve our own community in times that are really challenging right now. Things like receptions after weddings and funerals. This is a wonderful example of what we are and aren't able to do right now. As it stands, when we have a funeral, people have just a few basic options. They can meet in the side of the room like we'll be doing in a couple days. If the weather permits, they can go outside or they can go off site. But we really can't host any kind of meaningful reception afterwards because they're in here for the service itself. The same kind of thing for a wedding. So if this were a dedicated space for fellowship, we would be able to offer those kinds of receptions at really meaningful and important times in our members' lives. And we'd also be able to offer some things like men's and women's ministry events. Some of the women's ministry events that already take place, like a Christmas tea or bunco nights, and the Tuesday afternoon lunches would just be a lot nicer if they weren't crammed into the side of a room or in a hallway. We've talked about being able to do something like men's monthly breakfast meetings, and bringing in a speaker and having some fellowship for those who aren't able to make early morning men's meetings. So a lot of things could happen that way, and a lot of things that we used to do could come back. Imagine if we were finally able to do Lenten soup suppers and a Shrove Tuesday pancake supper. Again, things that old-timers remember so fondly. We'd be able to do family ministry events like we used to do, like movie nights for families where we would bring in popcorn and refreshments and everyone would watch a movie together. We'd be able to do things like after-school programs like we used to do with an arts program downtown, reaching out to those families around us. We'd be able to do things like vacation Bible school. We could have coffee hour in a conditioned space and so much more. You dream it, this is a beautiful room to do it in. And if we had our own sanctuary, there were a lot of things that, would be able, that we would be able to do there as well. We have been phenomenally creative with this space. And I really do have to tip my hat to the clergy uh, who assist me and to the altar guild who has got to be the most patient and altar guild I've ever seen and the even more patient choir as they've had to deal with things that are not typical in the Anglican world. So as wonderful as this fellowship hall is, and as well as we've been able to use it for worship, there's just so much more that we think we could do with a beautiful space. For starters, I think all of us intuitively understand that there is nothing that compares with experiencing the presence of God in a dedicated, sacred space. There's just something that happens when you walk into a sanctuary and you see the altar, and you see the pews, and you see the stained glass. You see that space that's set aside to do worship, and it opens us up. On a side note, if you want to know more about that, that was part of my doctoral dissertation, I'd be happy to tell you some of the reasons why. But it would also be a beacon of hope to the community around us. Someone once likened churches to hospitals. When you drive by a hospital, you know it's there for healing. It's an impressive building. You can't miss it. And so it is with a church. But one of the things that I've heard from the Belcourt community is that some people didn't even know this was a church. They live in this neighborhood. They drive by it all the time, but they just weren't sure what it was. And part of the reason for that is there's no big church structure. There's something about that church structure that says to the community, this is a place to find Jesus, this is a place to find healing, this is a place to find hope. And so a sanctuary would be a sacred space for us to experience the presence of God, and it would be that beacon of hope to the community around us for them to know that if they need help, that a church is here. And it is a place where we would not have to be quite so creative in the way that we use our space. Things like Weddings and funerals can be done just a little more traditionally in the way people envision them being done in that kind of sacred space. They're kind of silly examples, but having been involved in a lot of weddings down through the years, I just celebrated 25 years of ministry, which is hard to believe, but most brides have a picture in their head of what the bridal party is going to look like, right? 
It's going to be the bride and the groom all the way up there in front and a bridal party usually cascading down the steps. That's a little hard to do in a space like this. It's also, I know this isn't the most important thing in the world, but for most brides, they want that big entrance. This is a pretty short aisle. For funerals, there are just some things that would be easier to do in a traditional space that, that a space like this can make kind of challenging. For instance, when we have a full body burial and bring in a casket, it has to come all the way up to the altar rail because that's the only place where it fits. And that's a little awkward when you then invite the entire congregation to come forward and receive communion and they have to navigate their way around the casket. So not the biggest things in the world, but we'd really love to be able to offer those services at such meaningful sacred times in a way that is a little more traditional. And we'd also love to be able to pull out all the stops for those things that we just do so well. I often joke with the preschool that if you like Downton Abbey, we're the church that brought you Downton Abbey. Nobody does Christmas and Easter like us, and I think you just heard that. We do those services so beautifully. And for those with long memories of the building downtown, we really were able to pull out all the stops and the decorations and in the music and the instruments that were used. And what would it be like to be able to do that again and to be able to use that not just to bless our own people, but to make disciples of those around us? We'd be able to offer healing prayer, not in the back of an acoustically live room where it's very hard to hear, but we'd be able to offer that off in a side chapel where they have more privacy and intimacy for an important time. We'd be able to offer some things that we've been not able to do for quite some time, like Lenten organ recitals, something that we did for, I believe, over 30 years, or was it 40? Close to 40, Close to 40 years. We'd be able to offer music concerts. We'd be able to bring in some speakers like we've done in the past when we brought in Dallas Willard or Lewis Smeads, gatherings that were too large for a fellowship hall and needed the size of a sanctuary. So there are so many benefits to having that new sanctuary. So where does it go? Just in case you didn't know, it goes right over there in that dirt plot. And it actually connects into this building. And when the architectural committee was working, one of the things that we did was we brought in key representatives from every one of the ministry groups that would be using the spaces that we were building to make sure that we were getting all of their voices heard. So the choir was represented, the acolytes, the altar guild, Sunday school, youth groups, small groups, all of these different groups here to help design the facility. And one of the things that they said was that we need to make sure that that piece of dirt is ready to build on. And so all of the utilities are already there. It's stubbed out for water, sewer, electricity, and they even over-excavated it because it would save money to do it without a building sitting right next to it. So it's ready to build on. So what are we going to build? The architectural committee, as I said, was represented by many different groups in the church, and we worked with class and architecture, and this is the tentative plan for the building. They took it through what's called schematic design, which means they kind of got the shape of the building, where the rooms are going to go, basically what things are going to look like, but they didn't go through the detailed phase where you decide floor colors, wall colors, where the plugs go, and all of the details that need to be done in order to build a building. And part of the reason for that is that we knew we wouldn't be building it right away, and so, for one thing, we knew there would be code changes that we'd need to be handling, but we also knew that once we got on the campus, we would likely realize there are some things that we didn't think of. And so these tentative plans are tentative plans. They're mostly the shape that we want, but we already know a few things that we'll be talking to the architect about. For instance, one of the things that's been raised multiple times is that we are most likely toilet poor. It would probably benefit us to have a lot more bathroom space because the bathrooms serve both the fellowship hall and the sanctuary. So there are some things that we're going to want to change, but let me walk you through that space. Starting up there at the top at the 12 o'clock position, you see the bathrooms. Those are the existing bathrooms. That's the existing bathroom lobby. And at the very top of the building, that's the fellowship hall. So that's already built, but you can see that the two buildings fit together. And there's a corridor there that connects the entrance to the church, the narthex, into the fellowship hall. And that means that we'll be able to come into the fellowship hall from the sanctuary without having to go outside. And for anyone with a long memory of downtown, you'll know that that has some wonderful benefits. 
If you grew up downtown, you'll know that if you were in church and needed to go to the bathroom, you either got to let everyone know what you were doing and go all the way up front and walk through the chapel, or you could leave through the narthex and go out onto the curb and walk through the patio and then finally go into another building. We'll be able to not leave the building at all. You'll see to the right of those bathrooms, the choir room. The choir has been remarkably patient. Uh, as it is right now, they store all of their music binders as well as their robes in a chair storage closet. And they have to warm up while everyone else is setting up the room, which makes it a little bit difficult. If you've ever been in a choir, you kind of need to hear things. And so they've been remarkably patient. They've been matched in their patience, I think, by the altar guild, but we'll get there in a moment. So it would be a dedicated choir room for them, and that choir room could also, it looks like, function as a green room if we're doing any kind of events in the fellowship hall and in the sanctuary. It would be a place for them to practice, warm up, and they can get all the way into the back of the church for processions in or come straight into the sanctuary area of the church. You'll see right below that is what we call the chancel. So if you don't know your Anglican architecture words, here we go. The entrance area is called the narthex. Then you come in where all the pews are and the congregation sits, that's called the nave. And then you typically go up three steps into what's called the choir chancel. And then you go up one more step after that into what is technically called the sanctuary. That's the space behind the altar rail and around the altar. And the altar is normally elevated three steps up yet again from that sanctuary floor. That's the kind of architecture we have. So there in the choir chancel, we've got the choir, we've got the organ in there so that the organist can finally conduct the choir and read music facing in the same direction, something she is unable to do in this space. I don't know how she doesn't get massive kinks in her neck, but somehow she does it, or she just gets kinks in her neck and doesn't talk about it. <laughs> to the right of that, you see the sanctuary area, of the uh, altar rail there and then behind that the three steps up to the altar itself and it was actually designed for this altar so this altar will make its way over there and if you don't know the story behind this altar the short story is it's made out of the walnut tree that was in the patio in the downtown facility so a wonderful nod to our past is always sitting in our midst below that chancel area you'll see two rooms in the very corner on the uh, right hand side that is the vesting room for the clergy Currently, we vest in a closet that will long-term be where the women's ministry gets to keep all of their plateware and glasses, but uh, right now they have to find other places for that, and we vest in that room. And then next to that, just to the left, is the sacristy for the altar guild. The altar guild has got to be one of the most creative groups I've seen in our wilderness years. They lived off of a cart out of a closet. They are wonderfully creative, and they're currently in the AV closet, a room actually designed just to house all of the equipment that allows us to have speakers and projection. And they, they make it work, and they also have to use the kitchen. So the Altar Guild designed their sacristy. It's what they wanted, uh, and they get one thing in there that really only makes Altar Guild people and clergy super happy, and that is that they get a piscina. So if we, we have fun words for everything, but a piscina is a sink that goes to the dirt instead of the sewer because we don't believe it's appropriate to clean vessels that held the body and blood of Christ and have that go into the sewer. So currently they have to work out of a bucket in the kitchen and then take the bucket out to the dirt and pour it out. A piscina is a traditional part of Anglican building. They can work in their sacristy without having to walk back and forth into another room. You'll see just to the left of that, the chapel. And the chapel is designed to seat about 40 people. It would be a place for small funerals and small weddings. So that rather than putting a, a small, uh, what I've done many times, or people in their 70s and 80s with a second marriage after a widow and widower, and they want to have something just small and intimate with their family, rather than floating them in a huge nave, you bring them into a beautiful chapel. And the chapel was designed to receive the old cross-stitch kneeling pads from downtown. Those are shrink-wrapped in storage and waiting to be brought into that space. It would also be a place where we can do our midweek healing service as well as chapel services for the preschool. If you look just to the left of that, you'll see a covered walkway and a little uh, arrow pointing there for columbarium. We plan to build a columbarium for cremated remains 
in the new facility. It's not exactly sure where it's going to go. It could be in a memorial garden in that general space. It could be built into the wall of the sanctuary under that covered portico. It could go in the chapel. The architectural committee will figure that out. But the plan is to have a columbarium for remains. And you'll see that covered walkway returns to the left back into the narthex. And right as it comes in there, you might be able to read that it says bell access. We will have a bell tower and the plan is to put in a bell carillon system. And that brings us back to the narthex, which is oversized so that we don't have any traffic pinch points as people make their way either outside or into the fellowship hall and then in the nave where everyone sits in the pews. It is designed to seat 400 people. I always throw in the caveat that I don't know how big architectural people are. So these may be people with narrow shoulders touching each other, but they told me 400 people. So that's the floor plan, uh, which is, it's a beautiful floor, floor plan. It's a traditional floor plan, but what is it going to look like? Well, the architects helped us out with that as well. This is a rendering from the corner of Campus Park in Buena Vista. And so as you look at that, you'll see the bell tower there towards the left. You'll see a little bit of that covered portico. And then you'll see as you kind of work your way over to the right, the back of the chapel. And then on the right hand side, you'll see what is behind the altar, those three stained glass windows. And if you look carefully just below the tallest roof line, you'll see a little bit of windows up there. The idea is that we'll have stained glass up high in the wall. And you'll see that a little bit better in another slide where they have a cut section. If you look all the way to the right, of the drawing there on the right hand edge you'll see a little bit of stained glass there that is this window right behind us in the fellowship hall this is a preliminary view of the inside standing from the narthex or the back of the church and looking up toward the altar this is not refined with any choices my my hunch uh, father spencer loves the white look here but i have a feeling it's not going to be quite so celestial white by the time the architectural committee ends up choosing floor colors pew colors wood colors window colors and wall colors so it'll probably have a little bit more character than we see here but you can get a sense for the space and if you look on the right hand side up high you'll see those windows that are up kind of in a in a second story position up very high in the room and as you look to the left of that you kind of see some gray gothic arches moving down that is for the pipe organ our hope is to put a pipe organ in the facility and obviously dead center you'll see where the high altar goes with those three panes of stained glass behind it and all of this is uh, tentative so it's it's subject to modification but this is the general idea of the space a beautiful traditional anglican architecture this is a cut section in case you have a hard time visualizing that. So on the right hand side is the covered entrance. Just to the left of that, the narthex. And then to the left of that, you see the nave where all the pews are and where the highest loft of the building is. You can see also those high glass windows. And if you look uh, where the narthex is, you'll see half of a rose window. They cut it right down the middle. So there'll be a rose window over the entrance area. And over to the left, then you'll see the choir chancel and the altar area. This is a close-up of the choir chancel. Uh, the plan is to have those three steps up into the choir chancel, a hanging pulpit. We'll finally have prayer desks again so that the clergy can operate for the first half of the service closer to the nave rather than all the way up at the altar. You can even see they threw a hymn board in there. And if you see that kind of lattice work on the wall, that's right in front of the returns down to the pews. So typically what we would do is come up the center aisle to receive communion and then return to our seats down the side aisles. And those side aisles are now ramps. If you remember a downtown facility, there were three steps there, so it was difficult for some people to get there. With this, those who have mobility issues will be able to get to and from the altar on those ramps. So what does it take to build all this? We've been working with Classen now for a number of years, and we reached out to them in April and asked them to run this through their estimating department. So these are the numbers from the architect construction company. These are not our numbers. These are theirs. So uh, these are as accurate as they could be in April. Prices vary uh, and fluctuate. Some things have gone down in price. Some things will go up in price. But this will give us a good sense of how much the building costs. Construction of the building itself is about $3.1 contingency 
Uh, is it 10 percent? What normally happens is as we move forward in the product and project and give more definition to it, the contingency goes down because they've nailed more things down. Contingency, by the time you go into construction, is basically for changes that you didn't think you were going to need to make and for surprises that you didn't know were coming. You dig in the dirt and find something surprising, contingency cost. The AV guy starts to put in the projector and you realize you didn't put a plug there, contingency cost. What I can tell you in the first two phases of construction is that we never went through all of our contingency funds. We've been very careful. Uh, and I, I have to say I'm not proud of that many things in my life, but the construction company and the architect both commended me for hating change orders. So we're very careful in the way that we use our funds that way. Insurance is insurance for the course of construction, so that's over and above what we have in our regular facility insurance, and it's based on the price of the project. So that's at 1.4%, another $44,000. $44, uh, furniture and equipment, that's for pews, rails, choir chairs, all the kind of furniture that needs to go in. But you'll notice we put a million dollars in there because we would really like to buy a pipe organ. We believe that we will be able to find one used for significantly less, but we've been told that a, the going price for the kind of organ we'd like is around $750,000. So for estimating purposes, we felt it was safer to put the price of a new one in there with the hopes that we would be able to find one used for significantly less. Overhead, uh, that covers them uh, keeping their doors open and then the fee, that's their profit in the entire project and general conditions is what they need in order to keep the project going, a trailer for the construction, uh, administration, power, phone, toilets, fencing, all that kind of stuff, bringing the project to about $5.3 million. It's a big price tag. But one thing that I'm always quick to point out is that we're currently sitting in about $6 million worth of facilities. So it is a big price tag, but we've already done something comparable to that. We are carrying about $1.5 million in debt. That's down from the two point one that we started with. The preschool has been successful enough that they actually service about $1.5 million in debt. So they are able to handle that load for us. So that's the project. And now we move to the Q&A section. And you get to ask me questions, and I get to try to answer. Are there any questions? Or if you'd like to see a picture again, just tell me, because this clicker's fun. Any questions? What happens to this space? This space right here? It's kind of designed to be a staging area, and so the idea is to leave this little bit of a stage in here. Uh, but these are also portable, so that if we ever needed to remove them, we can. With a, the reason, just in case you wondered, that we didn't put an actual stage in is that if we put an actual stage in, we're required by code to put ramps on it, uh, which is why we didn't do it, because the ramps uh, ate up a lot of floor space to make them compliant. So by having them be portable, it's not considered a stage, and we can avoid that. So long term, when we do uh, something like Lenten teaching series, we'll have tables out there, people sitting at tables, and then the presenters will be up here in the, in the staging area. Or it could be cleared out and used for anything else that someone wants to use it for. Other questions? You all are easy. That's a great question. So if we move forward, what is the timeline? And in some ways, we can't give a complete answer to that because it's contingent upon a couple of things. It's contingent, first of all, upon a campaign and how successful it is, because that will allow us then to have conversations with the bank. So the more successful the campaign is, the less that we're going to need from the bank, uh, and, and vice versa. So there's some timeline involved in that. We also have about two months, I believe, of architectural work left to do in order to produce construction documents. Uh, and perhaps John Carnes can correct me on this as the architect in the room, but my recollection is that once we get construction documents, we need anywhere from one to two months for those to go through city planning and be approved. After that, you need about a month of bidding. Uh, and once we uh, take it out to bid and choose someone, then they just need to pull permits and we're off to the races. So there are a few things that need to happen that way, but 
for the most part, until we know what our financing is going to be, it's going to be slow moving forward. So if we run a campaign this fall and we wrap it up by Thanksgiving, I think we can expect to see construction sometime next year. And I would guess, uh, this is a question I've often had, but I'm guessing, and since I've got John in the room, I'll give it to him again, but I would guess this is about a nine-month to one-year build. We built the entire campus, including site development, in one year, and the admin building was supposed to take six months, so I'm guessing the sanctuary will be kind of in the middle of that. It'll, it'll be a year. Oh, a lot of finished work. But I'm still hoping for nine months. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It'll probably be the most frustrating project to watch because it's going to, the sticks will go up fast, the walls will look beautiful, and then everyone's going to want to get in. Other questions? The, uh, our consultant, Greg Holt, is going to be working on the results of these focus groups, and if we get enough participation in the focus groups, we should have that report uh, in front of the board by the 25th of July, at which point they'll make a decision as to whether or not they want to move forward with the project. If we need more focus groups uh, to get more participation, then that'll just kind of be bumped along. But we should know what we're going to be doing by... Uh, by early August at the latest, whether we're going to proceed or not. <clears throat>